Johnny McGonigal, you rascal. First off, straight, straight, uh, straight from jump. Happy Labor Day. All right. Happy Labor Day. And happy Labor Day to all the Penn State fans who hopefully every every fan that went to Morgantown to see Penn State's impressive uh, season opening win over the Mountaineers. Hopefully they got by they got back safe. Hopefully uh, none of them, all of them are nice and dry. Uh, it was it was a challenging opener, but it was more about the weather than the Mountaineers. Right. For for Penn State, Johnny, um, a two hour and 19 minute lightning delay, lots of rain. You know, they had a, they had a quick warm up to come out in the second half up, I think, 20 to six. They score again right right away. And that really, you know, they shot out the, the Mountaineers porch light, I think, with that drive. And then it was just their their athletes, their depth. Drew Aller, all of it. So many positives, Johnny, which leads us into James's uh, Labor Day press conference noon on Monday. Uh, we both have, I think, some stories up on Penn Live already. There will be more coming. There's going to be more podcasts with you, me, Max, Ralph. We were all out there. Joe Hermit was out there. But, Johnny, I'll start with you. Uh, your top reaction or two what, to what James had to say with Penn State now getting ready for their home opener against Bowling Green. Yeah, Bob, for, first and foremost, off the jump, I'd like to give a shout out to our guy, Joe Hermit, because yeah. he got the photo of the day. Harrison Wallace, uh, his first touchdown, <laughs> threw up a peace sign and yeah. seemingly locked eyes with the camera, uh, blew up on social media, got some got some justifiable you know publicity there. Uh, our guy Joe Hermit, the best as usual. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the, the full team at Penn Live uh, was uh, was doing work, doing some good work in Morgantown, and uh, like you said, Bob, after the press conference as well, uh, you have a story up, uh, mm -hmm. I believe, on Drew Aller, the swagger, the confidence <laughs> that he played with, and 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 not only played with but earned is yeah. what James Franklin said during his press conference. Uh, we saw it on Saturday against West Virginia. You know, him scrambling, running confidently. You know, there was a, 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 a downfield fake. It was like a Josh Allen type deal where, you know, Josh Allen's like eight yards running downfield and he still does a you know, pump fake to throw a linebacker. Stiff armed a dude. He's jawing with defenders. He got in the ref's face early because he was yeah. upset over some simulating uh, snap counts, I believe, uh, which caused the fumble early in the game. So I, I just thought that was really interesting to hear James talk. Uh, about Drew in that manner that, you know, as a second year starter, you should be different. You should have a different edge to you. You should have more confidence. And uh, Drew showed that uh, in week one. And I, I thought that was one of my biggest takeaways of, of the season opener. Yeah. And you, you mentioned somebody like Josh Allen. Look, Drew Aller is not, is not Josh Allen, but he is, he is significantly different uh, this year. I think the, even the Penn State, I don't know how much you could tell, maybe uh, on TV, but in person and just watching him, um, he's still 235 pounds. He was a little, he was a couple LBs, I think, bigger last year. But more importantly, uh, James mentioned the strength and conditioning staff. He looks different. He's 235. He looks every bit of 235 because he's every bit of 6'4", at least. But he is, it, it's clear, right? He His movement skills are different this year. And for a guy with a rocket of an arm, that's a huge deal because time after time, it wasn't just um, – he finished with 44 yard, yards rushing. He had three runs of 10 yards or more, 10, 10, and 15, I think it was. But he made plays in that game on third down. They were not designed runs where either nobody was open or West Virginia's rush was starting to get to him. And I don't think he makes those plays last year. I, I don't think that he was he was quite nimble enough or maybe comfortable enough um, you know, to not panic and to just kind of look for the lane and then then accelerate upfield. Um, and that's a big difference. Those two or three plays in that game made a huge deal. Penn State's defense is going to keep them in just about every game, probably every game this year. If Drew can extend two or three drives with, with plays like that, it's discouraging to the opponent. It, it lifts up his teammates. It lifts up the offense. And now they have to defend that, right? So a significant, I think, opening uh, – opening game for Drew Aller. I know West Virginia's defense isn't, isn't Big Ten caliber, but very encouraging. And I'll just, I'll leave you with this, Johnny, and leave the Penn State fans with this. I just, I just remember, I know you do, just the way he looked 
after that Ohio State loss last year in the media room, you know, he looked inconsolable. It looked like his world, you know, was coming, crashing in on him. Ohio kid who he really wanted to win that game, and it just wasn't his day. Ohio State was too good. He didn't get any help. But to see him now and how he looks now, to see him with confidence, to see him, you know, become a leader, he's a captain, um, he has come such a long way in less than a year because I think that game was was in Oct- October. I hope he can build on this, and if he can build on this, hey, Penn State's legit. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly, and, and I was just about to say, Bob, it's about building on it. It's about continuing it because, you know, we, we did see Drew look really good in week one last year against yeah. West Virginia uh, with uh, Mike Yersich as the coordinator, with the wide receivers that they had, and ultimately, you know, kind of failed him a bit as, you know, at, at times um, pretty consistently throughout last season. Uh, but what you mentioned and what we just talked about with the swagger and the confidence and the running of the ball uh, with Drew, I think, is really important. I mean, four of his six runs against West Virginia went for first downs. They extended drives. They yeah. uh, ended up in touchdowns. Um, and when you complement that, and it's really just a complimentary piece to what he already brings as a big arm passer in an offense now with Andy Kotelnicki that is scheming receivers open. Uh, the explosive plays were hitting. Um, I think Drew had eight eight completions in the first half. Six of them, I believe, went for 15 or 18 yards or more. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, two 50-yard throws in the first half. We know the bomb to Amari Evans that he came back for, uh, which set up, you know, that that shoulder, uh, that that end zone throw. Yeah. And the and the half was, uh, you know, a big exclamation point. Uh, and then earlier in the game, the 50-yard catch and run that Harrison Wallace had. I mean, what what a game! you know, for Trey Wallace to establish himself as his team's number one wide receiver. We talk about having to build on things with Drew. That's something you want to see Harrison Wallace at third continue to build on as well, obviously, as the season goes on and for him to stay healthy. But, you know, that's the kind of receiver that Penn State thought it had last year before injuries derailed his season. Um, And, you know, it's a hell of a game. It's a hell of a start uh, for Aller, for Wallace, for Penn State's offense. It's just got to continue to go. But, uh, I really liked what I saw from those two guys, and then mm-hmm. you know schematically from Andy Kotelnicki. Yep, I think when you, I think my favorite throw of Drews on the day was the t- the second touchdown throw to Wallace, where he put it, and also the athleticism and and the the awareness of of Harrison Wallace to know where he was by the boundary to get his feet down. But Drew put it, you know, he put it in a great spot, you know, and it was really, you know, that. There was he was out of time, right? They, there was only I think ten seconds left on the clock when the ball was snapped. That that was my favorite throw. I think he finished eleven of seventeen, Johnny. There were only two throws that I can remember that I think Drew wanted to have back. He missed Omari Evans in the first half across the middle. He threw it behind him, and there was a throw from the far hash. He threw it out that was late, and I mean, if it had been, you know. It, it could have been intercepted if if it was closer, maybe to to the receiver. But other than that, that's 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 kind of nitpicking, you know. The other fifteen throws were, were really really good. And last year, you know, when Drew had some games where he threw the ball a lot, there were a lot of throws maybe that either they were too hard or too high or just just not you know accurate enough. I thought he was extremely accurate. He made some really, really good throws. I, very encouraging. It is West Virginia. He looked yeah. great against West Virginia last year, right? So let's not let's not anoint him yet. But I do. I just wanted to say, you know, I, I noticed we always talk about Dane Brugler. I think Dane Brugler's top 50 list going into the season. Drew was number 50 on his list, which I think was aggressive, a little bit aggressive, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a talent-based projection, but that's what Dane does so well. And after this week, uh, he's, he's, you know, he's not 50 anymore, but it's going to be, he's going to have to, if he can, if he can kind of just kind of piece these games together and stack them. And especially against some big 10 defenses like Drew, Drew's going to do quite well for himself, but Johnny back to get back to something you said, and I wanted to get your reaction, you know, the nuance of Andy Kotelnicki's schemes, he, he, uh, James talked about it today. He was actually asked a question about Julian Fleming. And, you know, Julian Fleming, you look at the stat sheet um, and, it, you know, you look at the numbers and you feel like he just was, you know, he was an afterthought in the game. But James, you know, talked about some plays that Julian Fleming 
uh, had an impact on J James says control what you can control. And that's what Julian does. Um, the precise route he ran, I think that set up Tyler Warren's touchdown late in the game where he kind of occupied the safety by running the route exactly the way that Andy wanted him to. He mentioned that. I also think he ran a really nice route on Harrison's first touchdown where Harrison was the outside uh, receiver inside. And, you know, uh, Fleming was the inside receiver on a twin to the right. Um, you know, Julian eventually worked his route to the outside. I think, I believe Harrison cut inside of him and he was wide open, but those are some of the things that it's the details. I think that really separate a good offense. You know, those details I thought were there at times in 2022 with Mike Yersich. I don't, I didn't really see that much detail in 2023. I could be wrong, but right out of the gate that this looked like a very concise, very precise Penn State offense. Uh, fans probably were eating up uh, Andy using Denga Ione in motion to just destroy some poor West Virginia defender. There's going to be a lot more of that. But I would just say I, I was glad James referenced some things that Andy's offense did in the game, and they're going to build on that. And also his usage of Bo Prabula early, I think, is all of these things, Johnny, are going to lead to headaches, I think, for Penn State's uh, – opponents on defense because now they got a game plan for it they got a game plan for drew maybe running they got to go they got a game game plan for Bo not always running and throwing the ball uh, stuff like that and the receivers um the way that they worked with it the offensive line venga i own in motion at 340 pounds all of it was fun but i do think um i do think there was a lot to to really dig into from the offensive side, we could talk about the defensive side. There was a lot to dig into on that in, on that week one win. Yeah, definitely. And and one thing too, because you mentioned Julian in there, just want to touch on Julian Fleming, you know, the Ohio State transfer that came in with a lot of excitement, and you know, he wasn't on the stat sheet. He didn't have a target, yeah. didn't have a catch, uh, but he did play thirty five offensive snaps. It was tied, you know, with Harrison Wallace uh, for the most among wide receivers, second yeah. most among skill players, behind only Tyler Warren. I got some emails you know, on Sunday and even this morning as we record this Monday afternoon, you know, where was Julian Fleming? He was on the field. And, and like James yeah. said, he was making an impact with the way he was running his routes. Uh, but And James also said that we do expect to get him more involved uh, in the actual passing game in terms of targets, receptions, and would expect that uh, this upcoming week against Bowling Green. But, you know, Bob, you, you touched on some of the specifics that I really liked watching uh, from Andy Kotelnicki's offense, you know, I love seeing a 348 pound, uh, yeah. you know, guard, you know, split out wide, come in motion on a crackback block. Uh, you mentioned Bo Perbula getting involved early. I mean, on Penn State's first drive, it was a third and two. Yeah. And you put in Bo Perbula for a speed option and they convert. Uh, you know, we heard all last season or really all last preseason, uh, James and the coaches and all that saying, you know, Bo Perbula is going to have a role. He's going to have a role. And, Maybe it was more of a Yersich thing that he just didn't want to use them. Uh, but Prabula, it was it felt like lip service by by the end of the season because you looked at how he was used last year. It was primarily, you know, garbage time. I mean, they filtered him in a little bit more uh, as the season progressed and towards the end and even in the Peach Bowl. But, you know, I, I thought that was a real statement of intent, you know, from Andy Kotelnicki and, and this staff uh, that Bo Prabula is, we're saying he's going to have a role and, and he is going to have a role. Uh, and, and so I, I like that, um, you know, Nick Singleton and, K and Katron Allen on the field at the same time in the shotgun, uh, not just the T formation that we saw last year. Mm -hmm. uh, Nick uh, lined up in the Wildcat at one point, uh, but a false start uh, nixed uh, the play before it even happened. Uh, so some really cool wrinkles and talking to some, some of the players after the game. Um, you know, I think w one of them told me that, yeah, that was only a third of the playbook. Uh, like that's, that's nothing. Right. You haven't seen nothing yet is what uh, Trey Wallace said. So I'm sure a lot more pre-snap motions, movements, uh, formations uh, and, and pairings uh, out there uh, that, that are going to surprise us, Bob, you know, considering that we don't have, uh, you know, 11 on 11 access in terms of practice and what we see, right. you know, they keep, they keep that pretty under wraps. Um, and so I think some big 10 teams might be surprised by what Andy uh, trots out out there, but this is kind of what we expected in terms of creating space for playmakers. Um, you know, you consider who scored the touchdowns. It was Harrison Wallace, uh, Tyler Warren, Katron Allen, Nick Singleton. That's Penn State's four best skill players 
and they all found the end zone. And I think that speaks volumes to what Andy wants to do with this offense. Yeah, and uh, one just one other play I, I noticed on offense. Uh, they he he lined up Singleton outside as a receiver, yeah. brought him in motion, and and gave it to him on a toss, almost at full speed. I, I like that. It's just it's the little things, right? That getting your players and using your players' best at attributes. James talked about that towards the end of 2023. You know, whether it's Omari's speed or Nick's speed, getting ball, getting you know, getting Nick the ball at top speed, right? Don't let him work up to it. And that he did that on that reverse, just, just simple stuff to free them up and to exploit what they do. Well, I, I, it sounds, I know it's not easy. It sounds easy, but it looked like Andy made it look easy against this West Virginia defense. Let's, let's flip it, Johnny, to the defensive side here on the blue white breakdown. You know, a lot of the things we're talking about, we could talk about because whether it was Julian Fleming or, or some other things, uh, because you know, watching the game on TV and watching it at the stadium, especially we have a great view from the press box of what it really looks like. I mentioned that because I got an I got an email. It, the game wasn't even over, and I, I'm not going to mention the person's name. Just piling on Abdul Carter for not doing much in the game, and much like Julian Fleming, if you look, if you look at the stat sheet, it it's not going to be kind to Abdul Carter, who's making the switch from linebacker where he excelled to edge rusher where that you know which makes sense I think he's dropped a little weight he's like 253 now but in the game one solo tackle right he had I think it was three penalties one of them he hit somebody out of bounds I think he was offside twice and I just think that if you're watching the game on TV you don't see maybe some of the things we were able to see I, I think it's very unfair to say he didn't play well in the first game at defensive end because he had one tackle, he had the penalties. They need to be cleaned up. But I, I did see it. James talked about it. Uh, he gave that offensive line hell. Um, they had a good left tackle. They needed to give him help. I thought he got home tw two or three times almost, just missed. He beat him inside once. He beat him outside. The ball either came out or the running back chipped. Um, he was they, – they knew where he was. And James said he thought there were a couple of plays where he got help. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But um, that's that is life as an edge rusher. You know what? You're only they're only going to remember the sacks. But in this day and age, where the ball's coming out quick, you know, ten sack ten sack seasons are rare. It's do, does he hurry the quarterback up? Does he force the uh, the offensive line to commit multiple bodies to him and free up maybe some of his teammates? That's what Abdul can do, especially with Deny on the other side. I thought the game. I thought his game was much better than the stat sheet kind of portrayed it to be. I think he will get better. He's going to have some games where he's got two sacks, a couple of forced fumbles. He was a close on a lot of plays. He can be better, but I, I think if you're a fan and you think he played uh, badly against West Virginia, I think you're mistaken. I would agree with that, Bob. Like literally, I, I just echo everything you said there because. There were times watching the game where you, know, you look at the stats and we have like live stats going, you know, in-house live stats on our on our computers during the game, you know, keeping tabs. And, and you see the tackles rack up for KJ Winston, for Jalen Reed mm -hmm. and, and all these guys. And you're like, wow, Abdul's pretty, pretty down there. Like, but it's it wasn't a surprise. It, it surprised me a little bit because you know, we sit, we see his get off and we see him, yeah. you know, affecting the pocket. And, you know, the, the, he had a couple of inside moves that just completely burn his guy. Uh, but they kept a running back in for pass protection. Credit to, honestly, credit to West Virginia's running yeah. back because I thought yes. they were great. I thought they yeah. were great in pass pro. Um, and, and West Virginia didn't really even throw the ball that off. I mean, and we kind of knew that West Virginia coming into this game was going to be more run heavy, try to grind it out. And uh, I think they had the six most rushing attempts of any college football team last year and uh that played out um this game and so uh, kind of coming into it I didn't think it was going to be a game where Abdul Carter was going to have a lot of opportunities to uh you know get a strip sack or anything like that um so I think West Virginia did a pretty decent job on him and and like you said knew where he was on the field you know at all times uh, there was also always going to be growing pains with this you know it's a new position for him you know we saw him rush the passer you know, as a linebacker a lot last year and, and you know, standing up even in the, you know, the Prowler packages, the third and mm -hmm. long, uh, obvious passing downs. Um, but this is a new position and, and it's week one. So, uh, you know, overreactions, it's very easy to do that. Um, 
you know, after after a week one win where you want to nitpick and you want to see what can improve. And obviously there's a lot to improve. Even the guys who played well, uh, like really well, like outstandingly well in, in the box score. You know, there's things for those guys to improve, too. Um, I, I just think, you know, a little bit of patience, uh, you know, for, for Abdul moving to a new position. But I did I did think that he played pretty well. Uh, just again, the, the box score wasn't going to show right. that. Yeah, and James James did say, and I do. I think that James is is, is very much like this. Um, he takes his he takes his uh, you know day after games very serious. The Sunday walkthroughs, correcting. You know, I think everyone gets to hear it if he's unhappy. He made he made he said he made a point to kind of talk with Abdul about the penalties. Just and he thought he he did he said Abdul was very receptive to what James was saying, and he was pleased with reaction because you know those penalties are not going to matter in a game where you are in control you know by early in the third quarter those penalties could matter against the ohio states and usc's now we can talk about usc usc's of the world in the second half of the game um james did did point that out i just want to talk about penn state's defense a little bit and say you know guys who pass the eye test physically and on the field um you know obviously jalen reed and Kevin Winston, I thought, you know, uh, A.J. Harrison, also Jalen Kimber uh, at corner. They started, James said, hey, look, just uh, pump the brakes. We're gonna, there's going to be a lot of guys start at corner because we like them all. Those guys all passed the eye test physically and in the game. Tony Rojas, I mean, we've been talking about him uh, ad nauseum since he was probably – uh, uh, you know, the second, you know, in his, in his second month as a January enrollee, but man, is he fat when, when, when he, when, when Abdul and Rojas were pursuing Garrett Green, I don't know if it was on that two point player. Well, I felt so sorry for whoever, I think it was Garrett Green. I felt yeah. sorry for him to see those guys at 245 and 253 running at him with just vengeance in their hearts. They, they, it, they just tracked him down. He passed the eye test. Deny Dennis Sutton is another guy that uh, I don't know how his numbers looked. Uh, he had a couple of plays there late. But just to see him physically whipping people uh, with probably 5% body fat uh, uh, was impressive. I, I bring all this up, Johnny, because all those guys look really good, and they're only going to get better. But I wanted to ask you about Smith Vilbert, number 92, who prior to – the West Virginia game, really, you have to go back to the Outback Bowl uh, that ended the 2021 season when he had three sacks and a half. James talked about him, I think, at media day saying, look, he's he's a big part of our plans. Of course, they had just parted ways with Jameel Lyons, who I'm sure what would have been a big part of their plans. But they need desperately a fourth edge rusher, right? You can't yeah. you just can't go through a Big Ten season with <clears throat> Counting on three guys, as good as Abdul and Denai might be, as, as high as they are on Amin Vanover, they need a fourth guy. I thought late in the game, you know, Smith showed a little bit to me. He's definitely gotten bigger. He's lankier. Uh, he's got leverage for days with those long arms and legs. I mean, he looks like a defensive end now. And James praised him for – and he – he, he had some serious praise on him there at the end. I think he said we're going to know about him on the national level at some point this year. I don't know. I don't know if I'd go that far yet. But James was James has been right a lot of times. But I just I was curious to what your thoughts maybe on what you saw from Smith, uh, Vilbert, and also what James said about him because it is it, it's going to be a big deal at some point. They have to find another defensive end. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I thought Smith Vilber played well and really his first extensive action in the last you know two years. I, I think he appeared briefly in the Rose Bowl, uh, if, if I'm correct. But yeah. really, you know, over the last two seasons, we haven't seen him. And so, uh, like you mentioned, Jamel Lyons no longer with the team. Zariah Fisher uh, out um, for an indefinite long term period with with an injury. Uh, so they do need that fourth defensive end. And at this point, I mean, it, it is Smith Vilbert, right? And, uh, you know, you talk about the depth uh, of this defense. I mean, Elliot Washington made a nice play yeah. um, with the interception late. Uh, there, there were guys flying all over the ball, even though Cam even though Cam Miller didn't start at corner. 
uh, you know, played played well, I thought. Uh, and so when you have your your starting defense, your top guys flying, I mean, Jalen Reed was a bad out of hell. That, that yeah. was, his, his hair was on fire from the jump. Yeah. Uh, KJ Winston had eight tackles in the first quarter. Uh, you mentioned Tony Rojas. I thought he was, you know, a, as legit as advertised there yeah. at the linebacker. I thought Kobe King was good in run defense. Uh, Dom DeLuca even made, got in there and made yeah. some plays and, um, you know, was in there on one of the fourth down stops. Mm-hmm. Zane Durant. Uh, was yeah. a handful at defensive tackle. Uh, and you talk about the the rotations and depth. I mean, at D tackle, you had, uh, you know, Devon, uh, Jay Thomas. You had Zane Durant, Hakeem Beeman, Kaziah. Yeah. Is- How about so- Kaziah running running down that quarterback from – Yeah. Well, he was- from middle of, I think he ran down Garrett Green. I'm like, what? I thought, I thought it reminded me of that Michigan defensive tackle uh, tracking King Tron Allen a little bit last year. But I was like, whoa. Yeah, yeah. He tracked him down and just uh, kind of grabbed him at his heels and, and tripped him up. I mean, that, that those are the kind of plays you want to see um, from your two deep uh, on defense, even if guys aren't starting, that they're still uh, obviously pushing for more snaps and more time. And, and you saw that. Uh, there was just a real intensity and tenacity uh, with this Penn State defense, not not that that's foreign at all, because we saw that aggressiveness mm-hmm. uh, with Manny Diaz over the last two seasons. But it was good to see uh, that that they were no less, uh, you know, bad out of hell esque. You know, really like I, I think Jalen Reed set the t- you know set the tone yeah. early, uh, and everyone kind of fed off of that. Uh, so yeah, I, high marks for me for Penn State's defense in their first game. Uh, under uh, Tom Allen, um, you know they came out with that, that four-two-five look on the first snap, uh, and I and just again, um, I think Jalen Reed at that Lion yeah. spot is going to be invaluable, you know, as the season progresses, and um, and, and as long as they can keep that intensity and play and play smart because there were penalties and it wasn't just Abdul, uh, you know, some some procedural penalties and stuff you want to clean up after week one, but. Um, you know, I, I thought it was all systems go from the jump, uh, and, and Garrett green, he, he was in hell in that, in that, in that first half. I mean, yeah. you know, the, the snaps and all that didn't do yeah. him many favors, uh, early on. Uh, but yeah, I, I, w- I was impressed by Penn State's defense as I was the last two seasons. So to see them carry that over yeah. was, was a positive sign. Yeah. And I also think, you know, Tom Allen, and you want to, you want to talk about contrast and compare Tom Allen. And Manny Diaz, Manny Diaz, Manny Diaz is as good as it gets as a defensive coordinator. You, I mean, the, the numbers are the numbers. Everyone loved him. He is a lot like Andy Kotelnicki in terms of uh, his schemes and like very precise and just a, just a hand, just preparing for Manny um, could not have been fun. It just could not have been fun. He made great use of all his players. But I would say this: I think Tom Allen is also knows his stuff, but also. The intensity just comes out when you see Tom Allen. Like, he is an intense guy. And I think, I, I don't know that, I mean, Manny probably is intense too, but, like, you can see it with Tom Allen, the way he coaches, the way he blows his whistle in practice. Just talking to him, he gets he just gets, he kind of, kind of works himself into a lather in a good way, right? Mm-hmm. And the, the reason I bring that up is I think Penn State's defensive players are going to feed off that, right? Like, they want to play hard for him. They know um, – he has their best interests at heart. He's going to try and play his best players. That's why the three safety look is going to be very popular. And I just think, I think that, um, I think the Penn State players are going to, they play very hard for him. They play very hard for Manny. But just thinking about Jalen Reed, I honestly, I don't think he'd ever admit this, but I think Jalen Reed is a very, very proud, very, very talented safety, a veteran. And part of me thinks, Johnny, that he's about had it with all the talk about KJ Winston. And I think he was like, Hey guys, I guarantee he's carried, carried it with them all off season. And I think he, it just all came out, right. It all just came out. Yeah. He, he beat people up out there. He hit He hit somebody. I think he knocked some bigger tight end. Uh, he almost knocked himself out, but he, it looked like it was going to be a completion in the first half. And he, he launched himself in a good way, not, not a targeting way. At a bigger body, he just was re- played with reckless abandon. I just it think he was, it was it, it was Cole Taylor, West yeah. Virginia's tight yeah. end. Yeah. The dude is six seven, like two sixty. Yeah. yeah, and Jalen Reed dislodged the ball, and and he came up, and it looked like he knocked the wind out of himself almost. Yes, 
Yeah. But he just couldn't help himself. Yeah. He I think he wants himself. the world. I think he wants the world to know that there are two safeties at Penn State, at least, who are going to play in the NFL. And I think it's a healthy competition. I think they motivate each other. But I think if it, in a world where maybe if Winston was on another team, I think I think I think we'd be talking a lot more about Jalen Reed. It's it's a luxury to have three safeties like that and to have those two back there. As in, they are enforcers. They are enforcers, and I think you're going to see that. So uh, I think this is a good problem to have where maybe he, he said he's got a chip on his shoulder. I think I think Penn State's good with that, and I think it's going to real. Those two are going to feed off each other if they're healthy all season. And it's it's not going to be fun, really, going to go trying to go across the middle with those two guys uh, lurking. And it's not going to be fun if you're a quarterback and you have to pass knowing – what's coming off the edge. It's, it's really cool to see. And I do think Tom Allen, uh, I don't think there's a big drop off, if any, between Manny and Tom Allen at, at, at coordinator. Yeah. And something to consider there too, Bob, is that obviously you replace Manny Diaz as the coordinator with Tom Allen, but all the other pieces on the defensive coaching yeah. staff stay the same. Anthony Poindexter is still the safeties coach, Terry Smith, still the corners coach and Dion Barnes, you know, coaching uh, the defensive line. So there's continuity there. Um, and especially we just talk about Jalen Reed, KJ Winston, uh, the corners coming in, AJ Harris yeah. and Kimber, I thought played well. And Cam Miller, when he got in there and uh, played well uh, in the secondary, having that continuity and, and, you know, having a base from which to work and knowing what works. I, I mean, Poindexter coached, you know, Jair and, and Jaquan, and you look at the corners who just left, you know, and the you know, Joey Porter before that. So um, there, there's a succession plan, you know, from, from uh, Poindexter and Smith's perspective, and, and they know what they're doing. And so I just think that's something that can't get lost. Obviously, Tom Allen, uh, being the new play caller, uh, is going to get, you know, all, all, you know, the, the pub and, and, um, and, and the credit. Uh, but, you know, th those coaches on, you know, yes. on the defensive staff uh, right. play such a huge role. Uh, and, and I think we'll continue to play such a huge role as this defense Looks like one of the you know elite units in college football yet again. And again, you don't want to overreact to week one. But when we right. saw what we saw from this Penn State defense over the last two seasons, and then we just saw what we saw on Saturday, it, it looks very similar. Yeah, and not to get well, well, way, way ahead of ourselves here on the blue-white breakdown, but I'm just going to tell you right now, after watching USC against LSU uh, in that game, um, I could not be more excited about our trip to the West Coast to see that game between the Penn State. I mean, it's the whole Penn State team, right? But Lincoln Riley's offense against Tom Allen's defense is going to be, I don't know, there, there's going to be maybe a couple better individual matchups this season. But Penn State fans, I'm going to tell you right now, that's circle, circle that game and do, do not do not go to the refrigerator do not go to the bathroom when Penn State's defense is on the field against Lincoln Riley's um, offense, because between the talent uh, on both sides and between and the coaching on both sides, that might be more than any one matchup. That's the matchup right now that I want to see more than anything else so far uh, moving forward in the season. Yeah, Bob, and looking looking ahead at this point, uh, you don't want to look past right one and zero, one and zero, one and zero. You don't look yeah. past Bowling Green, but. Uh, this was a big one to get out of the way yeah. early at West Virginia to get this win under your belt because now you go Bowling Green at home, you get a bye week, uh, Kent State at home, Illinois at home, UCLA at home, and then you go out to USC. I mean, at this point, you know, yeah. Penn State should be undefeated, you know, going into that. I, you know, I'd be stunned if they weren't undefeated yeah. going into that USC trip. I, I mean, and at this point, I mean, Penn State's going to be favored in every game except the Ohio State game and maybe USC. I mean, if maybe if USC is undefeated mm -hmm. at that point too, uh, then we could be looking at a, a real, a, a, just a phenomenal matchup out in LA. I think it'll be good regardless, but uh, yeah. this, is, this is a big one to get under Penn State's belt um, early, you know, against another power conference team, regional yeah. uh, opponent um, and, and be able to, you know, obviously win these next handful of games, but also just get a lot more guys in, um, you know, find out more what you got um, in terms of, you know, the two and even three deep, uh, especially in these next two games, especially this weekend. Uh, but Penn State's in a really good spot right now. Um, and especially you look at what, what else mm -hmm. happened 
in, in the country in college football in week one uh, and even week zero, uh, some some ranked teams losing that you didn't expect or uh, you know some really close calls. I mean, shoot, Oregon had a close call at home against Idaho. Yeah. Um, you know, Virginia Tech went and, and lost at Vanderbilt, Virginia, you know, and, and the list goes on. Florida State lost to Georgia Tech week zero. You know, things things can happen week zero, week one that you really don't expect the, that first game jitters and the rustiness and everything else that goes along with that. And for Penn State to come out uh, and be so thorough uh, and convincing and resounding in that win against West Virginia, um, it, it felt like the difference was more than 22 points. Uh, yeah. and, and so just a really good week one for Penn State. All right, Johnny, enjoy the rest uh, of your Labor Day Monday. Penn State fans, I hope you have a great Labor Day Monday. We'll probably be back at some point. Uh, I don't know. I see be, it'll be either Johnny and Max or me and Max or me and Johnny. I, I can't get it all. I can't get it all together. It's, I'm excited. It's nice out. Penn State's 1-0. We'll be back later in the week with more podcasts. Johnny, stay out of trouble. I'll check back with you later this week. I'll do my best. <laughs>